I think uh, after this interesting discussion, I, I must admit, I, th I see very much a, a challenges here. I think there are also elements to the IRB use test in the future, because I think these methods will be more and more integrated into the pricing. So how it's being dealt with in the regulatory space, space will be a key challenge. So I think, uh, thank you very much. Then I think we are moving to the last presentation by uh, Andre, uh, who actually has had a past the DBA. Uh, a very long time ago, but it's now <laughs> with, uh, with uh, the Federal Reserve, who will give a presentation on uh, the effects on, on, on cybersecurity attacks and how the uh, financial sector and the role of the financial sector in, in, in integration into corporate, how they are handling this. So um, I will give the floor more or less directly to you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. So, so can you hear me well? And let yes. me share my screen in the meantime as well. Okay. All right. So I trust you can see my screen in, in, in full. Everything is fine. Perfect. All right. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank the, the organizers for putting the paper into the program. It's a great pleasure uh, to be back to the EVA and to this conference, even if uh, virtually. So the paper I will present today is entitled Pirates Without Borders, the Propagation of Cyber Attacks Through Firm Supply Chains. And this is joint work with Matteo Crosignani at the New York Fed and Marco Machiavelli, that is my colleague at the Federal Reserve Board. And of course, the, the usual disclaimer applies. All right, so let me start by giving you some motivation to this paper. So you probably heard more and more news about cybercrime uh, in these last few years. And in fact, cyber attacks have been growing in frequency and are now one of the most pressing concerns for both firms and banks. So for instance, according to the latest executive opinion survey of the World Economic Forum, so this was done pre-COVID, but according to the survey, CEOs in both North America and Europe currently list cyber attacks as their number one risk that their businesses face. And cybercrime is an ever-changing threat that's comprised of different actors, objectives, and techniques. So for instance, on the one hand, we have the traditional hackers that perpetrate ransomware and denial of service attacks, mostly for small financial gains. And on the other hand, we have state actors that use considerably more sophisticated techniques to obtain strategic information, for instance, intellectual property, or in more extreme cases, like the one we, we look at in this paper, to disrupt the critical infrastructure of a target country. In parallel, we know that the production of goods and, st and services is structured around very complex supply chain networks in which individual firms rely on inputs from other firms from around the world. And we know that these customer supplier relationships are uh, absolutely key for the transmission of shocks. And this has been shown to be the case following natural disasters, following great supply shocks, and even following uh, the recent pandemic. Uh, what I want to highlight here is that cyber attacks have some features that make this type of shocks unique. Uh, specifically, when compared to, for instance, natural disasters or crazy supply shocks, cyber attacks can spread instantaneously without any sort of warning signs and are often not geographically clustered. So in other words, cyber attacks have the potential to affect multiple firms uh, around the world in the same instance uh, uh, without giving any sort of time for these firms to prepare for what's coming. Uh, the key point I want to make here is that despite this increased attention by policymakers, by, by practitioners, even by academics to a certain extent, to the impact of cybercrime on the firms that are directly hit, there is little to no empirical evidence on whether the effects of cyber attacks can be propagated through customer supplier relationships, and that's exactly what we try to uh, shed light uh, in this paper. So what we do in this paper, so in a nutshell, what we'll do is to examine the economic impact and supply chain effects of the most uh, damaging cyber attack in history so far that accidentally spread beyond its, its original target and affected uh, several firms around the world. So we'll have three research questions that will guide my presentation throughout. So the first obvious question is whether the negative effects of cyber attacks on the firm that are directly hit can propagate downstream to their customers and upstream to their suppliers. If that is the case, we are also interested in understanding how do these firms in the supply chain, so either affected customers or affected suppliers, are able to cope with the shock. Are there any associated real effects, for instance, decreases in investment or employment? And crucially, we want to understand what role, if any, 
do banks pay, play uh, in mitigating the impact of this temporary liquidity shock on firms? Uh, and, and finally, we are also interested in understanding whether there are some persisting changes in customer supplier networks in response to cyber attacks. So probably in this last point, I will not have uh, time to go through it in this presentation. All right, but let me give you some background information here. So we exploit this unexpected large-scale cyber attack that occurred in June 2017 that was named NotPetya. So according to the CIA, this was an effort by the Russian military intelligence and it was purely targeted at disrupting uh, uh, Ukrainian organizations. So the initial vector of infection was a software that is widely used in Ukraine for tax reporting. And initially, this appeared to be just another simple ransomware. So this is an actual screenshot from one of the infected computers. And, and if, you, if you look here at point one, it seems that he's asking to send $300 worth of Bitcoin to a given uh, address. And if you do so, the computers will be decrypted. However, the true, int uh, true intent of this cyber attack was simply to encrypt and completely paralyze the computer networks of Ukrainian organizations. In fact, many firms tried to send this payment over, but nothing happened. The, com the computers uh, remained encrypted for weeks. Uh, and this affected uh, uh, government organizations in Ukraine, power plants, hospitals, uh, you name it. Even, even the computers of scientists in the Chernobyl cleaning up site uh, were completely wiped out. Now, the key feature we exploit in this paper is that this cyber attack accidentally spread beyond its original target, that was Ukraine, and infected global firms uh, through their Ukrainian subsidiaries. And uh, this ranged from the, the pharmaceutical heavyweight Merck that was unable to produce uh, and ship vaccines for a few weeks. Uh, it affected FedEx, for instance, that was unable to process new and existing orders again for a few weeks. And it also affected the shipping giant Marsk that not only owns uh, these vessels that we see every time we pass by a port, but also managed some of the largest ports worldwide. So, for instance, the port of New Jersey was basically in operational, in operational for almost three weeks because the computers in the terminal were wiped out so they were black and they didn't know which vessels were coming to deliver goods and which trucks were coming to pick up these goods so but back to the paper so we are able to identify 10 very large global and publicly listed firms that were directly hit by the shock uh, uh, with total costs as reported by these 10 firms of $2.2 billion. So this includes, uh, as I mentioned before, Merck, FedEx and Marsk, but also Saint-Gobain, Mondelez, Hackett, Nuance, Beiersdorf, YPP and DLA uh, Piper. So we have some evidence in the paper that the stock prices of these 10 firms did react uh, considerably after the announcement that they, were, uh, that they were hit. But what I want to highlight here is that despite these staggering billion dollar damages of this cyber attack uh, on these firms, the supply chain effects of this or any other cyber attack are still unknown. And that's exactly what we focus on in this paper. So we are able to identify 209 indirectly affected customers. So these are customers of these 10 directly hit firms that are spread, as you can see from this map, that are spread pretty much uh, uh, throughout the world, with most of them in the US and Europe. We are also able to identify 331 indirectly affected suppliers. Again, same, same picture, most of them in the US uh, and Europe. All right, very quickly through the data. So we identify the directly hit firms by scraping SIC filings and manually checking uh, 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 thousands of newspaper articles that, that mention NonPetya from the Dow Jones Factiva database. Then our main source of global supply chain relationships is facts at Revere. So this has almost 1 million relationships between large, mostly publicly listed firms from around the world. And very important for us, it, it, it tells us the start date of the relationship, the end date and the relationship type. Uh, we also use firm level data from, from Orbi, so this has balance sheet information for over 350 million firms worldwide. And once we clean everything up, we end up with around 50,000 firm year observations. So this is around 10,000 unique firms from 2014 to 2018. And as I mentioned before, we have 209 indirectly affected customers and 331 indirectly affected suppliers. And finally, uh, and very important for our paper, we also want to zoom in into the role of banks uh, uh, in, in sustaining this liquidity shock. Uh, and to do so, we use credit register data, loan-level data for the US. So this is the Federal Reserve Y14 uh, database that has information at a quarterly frequency on all credit exposures exceeding 1 million for the largest 37 banks uh, in the country. 
All right, so I will go very quickly uh, through the identification strategy because we use a very standard differences in differences approach that simply compares before and after the shock firms indirectly affected by the cyber attack through their supply chain, so either affected customers or affected suppliers, with unaffected firms that operate in the same industry, country, and size quartal in the same years to make sure that the, the comparison is as fair as possible. So more formally, this is the specification we use. The only thing that is worth highlighting here is this ETA JT that is basically the peer group of firm I. So it's this industry, country, size, quartile, year combination. Then when we move to the loan level analysis, everything is the same as before, except that now we operate in, in a, a matched firm bank panel at the, at the quarter level. Uh, and and uh, differently to what I showed you before, now we can also include bank quarter fixed effects to control for any sort of time varying bank characteristics and absorb bank specific shocks to create supply. All right, so let's go to the results. So first, the first part of the results, we want to see if the negative effect of cyber attacks on these 10 directly hit firms can, can propagate downstream to their customers and upstream to their suppliers. So let's start with downstream propagation to customers. So the outcome variables in this table are revenues to assets in the first three columns and EBITDA to assets in the last three columns. And what, we, what you can see immediately is, is a, significant, a negative and significant uh, coefficient uh, irrespective of the model that we use and the outcome variable we consider, which basically tells you that the disruption uh, caused by the cyber attack strongly propagated downstream, leading to lower revenues and lower profitability for these uh, indirectly affected customers. And it's important to highlight how economic significant uh, these effects are. So if we look at the coefficients in columns three and six, uh, it, indicates, uh, it indicates a 5% drop in operating revenues and a 2% drop uh, in EBITDA. So a conservative estimate suggests a drop in profits of at least $10 billion for these indirectly affected customers, which should be compared with the $2.2 billion for these directly hit firms. Sorry. So this showed you, shows you exactly the same thing as I showed you before, but now I'm just splitting the, the average coefficient by the time that elapsed since the reform. This is just to show you two very quick things. First of all, that the effect is relatively stronger in the first year after a cyber attack, it, which makes sense given that this was a temporary liquidity shock. And crucially for our identification strategy in any defensive type of paper, it's just to show you that the parallel trends assumption does seem to hold uh, in our case, irrespective of the outcome variable that we look at. All right, next we move to potential upstream population to suppliers. So you can see immediately that all the coefficients are insignificant. So basically we don't, it seems that for the suppliers of these directly hit firms, it was business as usual. There is no statistically significant upstream effects to the suppliers of directly uh, hit firms. So the way we see this is that the shock, the cyber attack seems to have impaired the ability of the directly hit firms to deliver products to their uh, immediate customers, but it did not impair the ability of the suppliers of these of this directly hit firms to deliver deliver the products to them, probably because they had enough inventory capacity. All right, so, so far I showed you that there was a significant downstream propagation of the cyber attack to, to customers. So now the question is, how do these affected customers uh, cope with the shock, okay? So, and there, there are at least three ways in which they can do so. So first of all, they, they can increase their reliance on trade credit from, from their suppliers. Alternatively, they can increase uh, uh, their reliance on external borrowing, or they can even use their internal liquidity, so their cash holdings, if they had some in their balance sheet before the shock. So let's look at these three margins of adjustment one by one. Let's start with trade credit. So what we see here is that this affects that customers were not able to increase their reliance on trade credit. Actually, it was the exact opposite. So these affected customers received less trade credit uh, from their suppliers with, after the shock, which further strained their liquidity conditions because as we know, trade credit is a key source for short-term uh, financing for firms. Uh, then we look at the other two margins of adjustment, so external borrowing and, and, and their liquidity holdings. And what we observe is that to deal with the decline in both revenues and trade rate from suppliers, these affected customers, what they did is to increase external borrowing and to rely uh, more in their pre-existing liquid, internal liquidity, so on their pre-existing cash holdings. 
And given all these adjustments, uh, an obvious question is, well, so are there any real effects or any changes in terms of investment and employment of these affected customers? And we see that that's not the case. So, so here we are looking at tangible assets and intangible assets, so uh, at, at investment, and we see that affected customers did not have to reduce investment following the shock. And we also have some evidence in the paper that uh, affected customers al also have a similar employment growth and wages after the shock relative to firms uh, in the control group. So given all these pieces of information, we were extremely curious in zooming in into the role of banks here and see exactly what, what, uh, what role did banks have in, in sustaining the impact of this liquidity shock that allowed firms to, to basically keep uh, investing and keep their, their levels of employment. So here we move into uh, uh, the loan level evidence from the US. The majority of affected customers in our sample are from the US and the outcome variables here are the total level of committed credit in the first two columns, then the total level of committed credit lines in columns three and four, and then finally in the last three columns, the share of drawn credit uh, uh, in, in total committed credit. What we see, we don't see any differences in terms of total committed credit between a bank and a firm or even between uh, of total committed credit lines between a firm and a bank. What we do see is that affected customers uh, significantly increase credit, credit line drawdowns to cope with the pressing liquidity needs following the cyber attack, which basically highlights the liquidity insurance function of banks, that this is what banks are supposed to do if firms uh, suffer a liquidity shock and if there is no uh, type of solvency problems, banks should step in and it seems that that was actually the case following this massive uh, cyber attack. Then we look at other margins of adjustments that, that banks could do, so interest rates, maturity, and collateral. What we see here is that although these firms were able to draw down uh, significantly more on their credit lines, banks did increase the interest rates uh, uh, that these affected customers were charged. And this was this is consistent with the fact that these banks perceived these affected customers as being riskier. So in the US rate register, we have a, an estimate of, that, that, uh, of the probability of default that a bank gives to a firm. And this perceived uh, uh, probability of default of these affected customers also went up following the cyber attack and banks adjusted the, the interest rate spreads as a result. All right, so in the final part of the paper, so I still have one minute or so. So basically we, want, we are interested in understanding whether there are persisting uh, changes in customer supply and networks in the response to, to cyber attacks. And very quickly here, what we see is that the cyber attack did work as a wake-up call. So we see affected customers more likely to form new relationships with alternative suppliers that operate in the same industry of the directly hit firms. And we also see some kind of reputational effect going on because these affected customers are also more likely to terminate relationships with the, the suppliers that got directly affected by the cyber attack. All right, so let me conclude. So what we do in this paper is to examine the economic impact and supply chain effects of the most damaging cyber attack in history so far. I'm sure that in a few years, in a few months, there will be an even, even more damaging cyber attack. And what we see here is that there, there were considerable uh, downstream propagation effects. So reduction in revenues, profits, and trade credit among customers of that directly hit firms. But we see that these affected customers were able to deplete their pre-existing liquidity buffers and increase borrowing through bank credit lines, which ultimately allow them to maintain investment and employment. Nonetheless, we do see persisting adjustments to the supply chain network following the shock. So in terms of policy implications, uh, what I would like to say here is that given how interconnected fir uh, firms are at a global scale, uh, the results highlight the need to have better security and contingency planning. And this applies not only to firms, but also uh, to banks, given uh, the, the potential financial stability implications that a major cyber attack to a major your bank can have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. So I think we also have uh, Monica on the line from University of Lutz for the presentation. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Lars, uh, for having me in this session full of papers uh, co-authored and discussed mainly by uh, different Andres. Uh, so I'll try, try to share my screen. Hope I'm successful. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so, given the time uh, uh, frame, uh, I will skip some slides. Uh, I will not repeat the uh, the main findings of the research. Though I must stress 
uh, that uh, I enjoyed the paper uh, very much, and uh, I, uh, I think it has uh, some uh, very, very uh, interesting um, uh, findings. Uh, both uh, for um, managing the uh, supply chain uh, and uh, actually um, uh, managing uh, the um, cyber attack uh, implications or uh, effects uh, from the from the financial uh, side. Uh, so from my point there, there will be mainly some. Um, some, some questions or uh, minor um, uh, comments. Uh, uh, of course, I, I, I liked very much the choice of the subject uh, because the 2017 Notizia attack was, was actually, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Andrea mentioned, uh, a very, uh, uh, very big attack with a huge consequences. Uh, so uh, I also uh, like the motivation of the um, uh, research, the justification for the for, for the choice of the topic. Um, however, I I, um, I will have some uh, further um, questions. Uh, for example, I, I'm from, from uh, the, the the paper itself, not the presentation, but the paper itself. I didn't quite get uh, what was the the exact number of uh, um, of the firms analyzed. As you've mentioned, the uh, 2001 customers and 314 suppliers indirectly affected. Uh, but then you mentioned some some firms uh, were excluded. So which numbers uh, um, correspond to the to the um, actual uh, um, analyzed um, uh, firms? Uh, uh, and what was the share of the of those analyzed customers and suppliers in uh, the uh, directly affected companies' um, uh, revenues and costs, so that we can know which portion uh, of the supply network uh, this discovers. Um, uh, obviously, the choice of the method was uh, was, was very good, uh, though I will have some question about the choice of the control group. Uh, so that, um, uh, I, I must say, it was an excellent use of different data sets, and I uh, certainly, you envy uh, some of the uh, data sources. Uh, huge job with searching uh, uh, SEC filings and uh, newspapers about uh, the, the, the firms uh, directly uh, affected, uh, and uh, plus uh, this uh, excellent uh, database uh, about global supply uh, uh, chain uh, relationship data. Uh, financial data, obviously, and last but not least, uh, uh, very, very good uh, um, source of uh, trade register data uh, from Federal uh, Reserve. So, um, to sum up, it's a very, very important topic, very interesting analysis, and impressive range of uh, um, data and uh, useful uh, findings. And uh, now, uh, some questions um, uh, from uh, my, my, myself. Uh, first of all, uh, my, my question was whether uh, the choice of the sample uh, uh, and its limitations might might have influenced the, the outcomes um, uh, of the study. Uh, you mentioned that uh, this database uh, uh, covers uh, large firms' relations only. So, so my question was, uh, first of all, what portion of relationships are covered, which I already uh, asked, and whether there is a possibility that smaller firms, uh, which were not included in your analysis, could react uh, some, somehow differently. Uh, the other um, issue was you've, you've, you've mentioned that uh, uh, obviously the, the customers that had few alternatives for directly hit supplier uh, um, uh, uh, was uh, was um, concentrated. Uh, uh, so so my my, my uh, perhaps question or suggestion was uh, to, to have, have you analyzed. Uh, Diversified versus non-diversified suppliers um, and um, customers. So, uh, what I mean, some some samples um, uh, of the uh, analysis. Sorry. Uh, uh, as as for the method, uh, as I said, the choice of the method is uh, uh, is is right for me. Uh, although I have a question about the selection of uh, of control group. Uh, how how did how did you uh, choose uh, those uh, those companies? Uh, you you mentioned that the, these were unaffected firms operating in the same industry, country, and size uh, 
uh, quartile in the same year. But my question was, uh, given that uh, many, many research uh, reports show that as much as half, two thirds, or even three quarters of firms experience a cyber attack, uh, how can you be sure that uh, you are actually uh, uh, comparing your uh, uh, indirectly affected uh, uh, companies uh, with actually unaffected um, uh, companies. So, so that was the basic uh, concern. Uh, uh, another question, because it wasn't sure for me, uh, is you analyzed firms uh, 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 from US and uh, Europe, as, as far as I remember, uh, but the uh, bank credit to firms data covered only uh, US banks. Uh, so my question was uh, uh, whether you, it was only subsample uh, that was that was analyzed, or you, you managed to have data for for um, uh, all companies, or that was just this portion uh, that was um, not um, included. Uh, and uh, second concern is that this data, um, as you mentioned, covers only the data for big banks and big loans. So, given the size of the analyzed firms, uh, is there a possibility that uh, they have loans in smaller banks or smaller loans in analyzed banks? So, this is not covered in that um, um, data. Uh, and um, uh, last not least, uh, uh, my question is, uh, you've, uh, you've noticed that uh, some customers uh, have changed their suppliers. Uh, have you checked whether this is a permanent, this was a permanent um, change? Uh, because uh, uh, I suppose you've ended your uh, your uh, analyze uh, on 2018 data. So perhaps if you could uh, go to uh, 19, uh, uh, perhaps you could you could see uh, whether this was uh, a permanent or they they came back to their to, to uh, their suppliers, to the suppliers. Uh, and uh, you also said that. Um, estimates indicate that affected customers are more likely than similar firms in the control group to terminate suppliers in the same industry as the directly hit one. So, uh, uh, my, my question was uh, if relations with suppliers are ter terminated in the, whole, the, in the whole industry, was it actually the effect of an attack? Because in case of avoiding the affected company, they, they would just switch the supplier and not terminate the suppliers in the same uh, um, industry, uh, I would suppose. Uh, perhaps uh, um, uh, also findings concerning those uh, internal liquidity buffers and ex in, uh, or uh, increased uh, bank borrowing, whether there was any irregularities, which firms uh, use uh, uh, which source and to um, uh, which extent were there any differences or regularities um, among um, different uh, industries, uh, perhaps. Uh, and um, uh, last portion is was uh, policy implications. Uh, uh, obviously, I uh, uh, um, I agree with the uh, uh, implications uh, for uh, better security. Uh, and needing to uh, improve risk management and contingency planning. Um, but I didn't quite understand uh, the, uh, excuse me, my cat uh, uh, is also interested in that. Uh, so, so I didn't quite get this, uh, um, the, the, the last suggestion uh, uh, was um, that uh, cyber aggressions for the money issues of not pizza state-sponsored hackers at least have an incentive to put in place controls to make sure that the attack does not spread beyond its uh, intended reach. So it was for me like saying to the bad guys, uh, don't be uh, actually so uh, um, uh, so uh, bad. Uh, but to, to, to conclude, I, uh, I agree that the paper has a very, uh, very important uh, analysis uh, and uh, uh, policy implications, uh, uh, and the, the, the important thing is that uh, the, those cyber attacks can create supply chain disruptions uh, similar to those that originate from financial crisis and natural diseases. Um, obviously, there's a question wh whether uh, also caused by uh, uh, biological factors, including pandemic, uh, uh, the, the, the current situation perhaps is uh, so different that we have uh, the whole industries uh, 
um, uh, um, suffering. Uh, but once again, uh, I enjoyed the paper. It's uh, very well uh, uh, written. Uh, if, uh, if my questions uh, could be helpful, uh, uh, it, it, I'll be happy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monica. So I think we also have a, a short comment from Andreas from, from, from the EVA who's working on this from our side. I, Andreas, uh, I think... Hello, Lars. I hope, uh, yes, I hope you can hear, hear me. I'll be as short as possible. Uh, first, uh, firstly, let me congratulate all the three authors for this very insightful analysis. As uh, I was mentioned before, we are actually lacking for empirical evidences in this area. Um, and uh, one of the outcomes, basically, of this paper is like it's it's really difficult and challenging to quantify the magnitude of such large-scale cyber attacks. Now, when I first uh, read this paper, uh, three key things came to my mind. First of all, uh, the fact that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, which is definitely applies to IT security here. So essentially, the impact of a simple uh, single supplier being disrupted uh, can affect multiple uh, parties down the chain. So cyber criminals will often pursue the soft spot of their ultimate target as a sneaky way into the network, essentially. And this is why we believe that all companies need to be uh, sufficiently protected against cyber threats as supply chain security it's every company's responsibility uh, and this is also one of the piece of advices we recently provide to the european commission achieve a cyber resilience baseline across the sector now the second aspect is that the increasing interconnectedness introduced by global uh, supply chains which causes as we see through the paper a complex web of digital dependencies and this is making all the involved companies prone to cyber attacks. And the third aspect is the importance of data availability, uh, which can allow us to quantify the magnitude of uh, such attacks and help us understand the criticality uh, and real impact of, of the attacks. I mean, a point made through the paper is that supply chain effects uh, of these uh, cyber attacks or other big uh, cyber attacks are still unknown. Um, so I'll also keep from the paper that um, cyber attacks can create supply chain disruptions similar to those originate from financial crisis and natural disasters. So the increasing disruptive consequences of cyber attacks have alerted the regulatory community both at international level. We've seen the cyber expert group established by the G7, the recent BCBS principles on operational resilience, and also at EU level, with the recent EU Cyber Security Act and the uh, draft proposal on EU Digital Operational Resilience Act. So all these initiatives aim to raise the cyber resilience baseline uh, for all institutions. Now, in terms of, of questions, and I'm glad I'm having this opportunity, I have three questions, two uh, most related on the assumption use and methodology, and the third one is a bit more um, uh, policy related. So on the approach followed, compare um, fair, uh, firms that have been indirectly affected versus um, firms that have been unaffected operating in the same industry, country, size, in the same year. Uh, one question would be whether there was an analysis made, whether other significant events actually took place during the same period that may have potentially impacted the indirectly affected firms or the unaffected firms. It would be good actually to understand and whether there was a thought about that because it will affect, of course, the, the impact of this specific cyber attack. Now, the, the findings also suggest that reliable access to external finance allowed affected customers to absorb the loss in profitability without having to cut the employment or investment. So the question here is, which is going to be quite useful, what happens uh, in case where this access to external finance is not available or is limited? Is there an estimate here, for example, if we had another exogenous shock or financial difficulties at entity level? Now, the third and last question from, from my side is that one of the conclusions is that firms need to improve their contingency planning and avoid reliance to a single supplier. This is, of course, a form of concentration risk. And at least at, e at EU level, there's a recent action 
were basically uh, trying to address this concentration and contagion risk for the EU financial sector by introducing an oversight framework for the critical ICT third party providers. And there are also other proposals requiring financial institutions to define a holistic multi vendor strategy. So the question here is, um, uh, and I will be keen to get the author's basic view, whether they recommend that the wider coverage, both from a geographical and sectorial perspective, so at international levels covering all the sector, it will be an effective way to build resilience, or these kind of requirements can only focus on entities that are involved in global supply chains. And I'll pause and I hope I was quick. Back to you, Lars. Thank you, Andreas. Well, I think it's my time management of the session. So I, I, th I think I think we have one question from Samuel, but to be honest, in, in the absence of time, I, got, I think we've already run substantially over time. I think I'll just give the floor back to Andre to kind of uh, react and, and, and then let's wrap the session. Yeah, let me just react to, to just a, a few points that were raised by in both discussions. So first of all, thank you very much, Andreas and Monica, for, for the, the, the thoughtful comments. Uh, so let me just clarify a few things. So one of the main points that were raised by Monica is whether, what happens if we have uh, treat, treated farms in our control group. So basically, what if some farms did not report that they were attacked and we have them there in our control group? This is likely to be, so this is unlikely because first of all, these firms, so many of the firms, for instance, in the US are, report, are required to report any major operational incidents by law. But even if they don't do so, uh, if we have some, some treated firms in our control group, we would be underestimating our effects because in a sense, our control group will be too stringent in a way. So that gives us some degree of comfort uh, there. Uh, you also mentioned the, the, the U.S. subsample, so just to clarify, yes, so these are only U.S. banks and U.S. firms. So, and we are lucky in the sense that in our setting, most of the indirectly affected customers are from the U.S., which allows us to zoom in uh, in more detail into them when we work in the loan level uh, uh, data. And on your suggestion to uh, extend the sample, to look at whether these are more temporary or permanent effects, it's definitely on our to-do list uh, and we'll do it as soon as it's, it's possible. Uh, on two, just very quickly two points uh, that Andreas raised, so on unobserved, unobserved factors that might affect the, the, the treatment and control firms differently, we are not aware of any and we did a, a a lengthy job in trying to find for, for some, some of these unobserved factors. What we try to do is, is to ensure that our control group is as tight as possible so that we are comparing firms that are incredibly similar in terms of industry, the country they operate, their size, so that any unobserved factor that you can come up with would affect in the same way the treatment and the control firm. So this is basically the best we can do in this case. And to your question, which is a very important point, which is, uh, what, so in our case, only for only the affected customers, so firms were affected, and the banks were fine. So there was basically the banks could easily just provide the, the liquidity that the firms need. So the question here is that what if both were affected by a major cyber attack, a major firm and a major bank that was providing funds to this firm? So we don't have a counterfactual here. So for us, it's impossible to estimate what would have happened if so maybe one can do this in Ukraine if one has loan level data for, for, for Ukraine, because in Ukraine there were banks that were affected as well as firms. So one can do this type of analysis there, assuming that this data is available. It's not to us. So we can only we can basically abstract from anything that happened in Ukraine and we don't include any Ukrainian banks or firms and just look at what happened in the supply chain uh, across the entire globe. Thank you very much, Andre, for a very interesting presentation. I, I think like uh, Monica also alluded to in the end, I think it's at least uh, kind of uh, encouraging to see that banks are reacting as in their role as the liquidity providers as they're supposed to do, Isn't especially it? in the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as we're seeing now. So so, so I, I think this is at least a, a very kind of encouraging. But uh, with that, I, I will not try and wrap up the papers because I think we're already over time. 
normally I would have been able to kind of hold you back to a, to a reception at this point in time, which is unfortunately not enough. But I hope that we will have the opportunity next year to see each other. And then uh, there's only to add that I think uh, I hope to all see you all again tomorrow at around uh, 2 o'clock, where Marcus Bonnemeyer from, from Princeton will give his presentation on money in, in the digital age. So I um, hope to see you all again tomorrow, and, and thank you very much today, and apologize for, for slightly going over time. Thank you.